And with that, I have the honor of introducing our moderator, Lorena Aguilar. Lorena is an independent expert on gender and environment for the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. Welcome, Lorena. Thank you, Rosaline. Uh, welcome everybody to our side event on gender equality for climate change. As Rosaline said, my name is Lorena Aguilar and I'm going to be your moderator for today's event. This event has been organized by the Feminist Action for Climate Justice, FAC, and has been sponsored by the governments of Costa Rica and the United Kingdom. Let me share some um, initial uh, thoughts. Uh, the impacts of climate change are heterogeneous and they're related as proposed by ECLAC to five structural knots of gender inequality. One, the socioeconomic inequalities and poverty in the context of an exclusionary growth, the patriarchal, discriminatory and violent cultural patterns, an unequal and limited access to resources and services, Fourth, the sexual division of labor and the unfair social organization of care. And the fifth, the concentration of power and hierarchical relations in the public spheres. These challenges all exacerbate each other and generate complex social, economic, cultural, and belief systems that hinder and reduce the scope of policies on gender equality and women empowerment, including actions against climate change and environmental policies. Although there is a robust international normative framework on gender equality and women empowerment in relation to climate change, many efforts up to date to address are limited to interventions that in their implementation had failed to break down unequal power structures or to have a structural impacts on closing those gender gaps or promoting the enjoyment of women's rights. Thus, gender inequalities continue to hinder sustainable development and manifest themselves in different areas and sectors. And initiatives related to adaptation and mitigation associated with climate change are no exception, as we're going to be hearing today. Climate action can therefore either reinforce, exacerbate, or even generate new inequalities, or intentionally aim to overcome them and accelerate progress toward gender equality. As country and communities, as we examine our policy, physical, economic, and social cultural structures in response to climate change, long standing gender inequalities can be and should be identified and addressed. Within this context, I have the honor to introduce the first group of speakers that will be setting the scene for the two frameworks, the FAC and UNFCCC, and the continuation of COP26. I will be brief in introducing our speakers since the bios are going to be included in our chat. Uh, three speakers we're gonna have, we're gonna have Her Excellency uh, Marcela Guerrero Campos, Minister for the Status of Women and Executive President of the National Institute of Women of Costa Rica. By video, we will have the Right Honorable Alok Sharma, MP, President for COP26 and the 26th United Nations Climate Change uh, Conference. And we're going to have Alejandra Cuiguantar de Tejiendo Pensamiento, who is a FAC CSO leader. Dear Marcela Campos, the floor is yours. Muy buenos días a todas y a todos. Espero que se encuentren muy bien. Eh, quiero eh, agradecer muchísimo eh, a ONU Mujeres y a la Coalición de Acción Feminista eh, por la justicia climática, por generar este espacio de diálogo en el marco de la CSW. Este es un momento eh, definitivamente eh, estamos ante un cambio de época en donde es inminente para alcanzar los objetivos de desarrollo sostenible 
poner en el primer plano el eh, centro del objetivo 5, que es el, el, la búsqueda de la igualdad de género en cualquiera de las acciones y, por supuesto, ante la acción climática. De ahí que unir esfuerzos para que desde las políticas públicas de los países podamos ubicar los compromisos de la acción feminista en relación al clima y género se vuelve eh, parte del andamiaje eh, de la toma de decisiones de los países. Ya Lorena Aguilar nos ha señalado algunos de los retos que en esa desigualdad las mujeres seguimos buscando una, eh, unas rutas que nos permitan, obviamente, no solo superar la pandemia, sino además incorporarnos definitivamente a la autonomía económica. De ahí que en esta transición que está viviendo la humanidad y el planeta, nos parece eh, necesario que las mujeres eh, que hemos abarcado algunos puestos de toma de decisiones, hagamos de forma vehemente un llamado para poder definir compromisos más claros, no solamente a nivel global, sino a nivel también de, los, de las regiones y los países. Esto implica acercar agendas que nos permitan tanto tener acciones concretas en la transición que vive el, el, el planeta en razón de su economía, de su estructura eh, social y de su gobernabilidad que sea amigable, obviamente, con la sobrevivencia del planeta. Y, eh, por supuesto, rescatar el tema de que en las políticas públicas y en los acuerdos globales la igualdad de género siga enfatizándose con acciones estratégicas que nos lleven a economías verdes, inclusivas, regenerativas, que reconozcan y trabajen en torno a la intersección que eh, necesitamos en razón de las particularidades de nuestros territorios eh, en las diferentes regiones del mundo. El esfuerzo que hagamos en términos de aumentar la participación de las mujeres y las niñas en toda su diversidad, en los procesos de toma de decisiones en todos los niveles y apoyando de forma prioritaria a las instituciones, eh, tanto estatales como del sector privado, así como el sector financiero en razón de poder establecer inversiones, sobre todo para la adaptación. Ya sabemos Vemos que el planeta tiene un compromiso con la mitigación para disminuir los efectos eh, que tienen los gases, efecto invernadero, pero necesitamos readaptar toda la concepción de organización social. Y eso implica que necesitamos impactar no solamente con una visión para descarbonizar el, 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 la economía, sino además adaptarnos y gestionar el riesgo. Esto implica financiamiento, tecnología, eh, conocimiento y, por supuesto, la gestión y la protección de los recursos naturales. Queremos las mujeres estar en esa nueva economía, en esa economía verde. Las mujeres y las niñas, especialmente del sur global, que se enfrentan a formas múltiples e interseccionales de discriminación, se ven afectadas de manera profunda y desproporcionada ante los eventos climáticos cada vez eh, que nos cuestan más, no solamente desde el punto de vista económico, sino también de la pérdida de las actividades económicas y muchas veces de la, de la, de la vida de las personas. La destrucción ambiental, eh, las desigualdades estructurales que siguen existiendo, sobre todo en las zonas costeras y rurales, impactan a las mujeres de forma diferenciada. Necesitamos datos para poder establecer esas políticas de acupuntura en donde tengamos respuestas no solo para mitigar, sino para adaptar y gestionar de forma más eficiente eh, el riesgo que sufren las poblaciones y por supuesto las mujeres y las niñas. 
Avanzar en igualdad de género a nivel local y nacional es un imperativo. Eso llevará a resultados importantes también en las acciones globales y definitivamente las mujeres necesitamos estar de forma activa en todas las estructuras de toma de decisiones con estas y otras políticas. Es por esto que el plan de acción lanzado en, en el Foro de París establece una guía de acciones que deben de tomarse en consideración sobre la participación activa en las finanzas, en el, lidera el liderazgo y la resiliencia, así como en los compromisos que establecen los países en las NDCs. Quisiera extender una invitación a todas las partes interesadas en trabajar de forma conjunta y unirse eh, a nosotras para hacer realidad esta visión que venimos trabajando desde diferentes regiones sobre la justicia climática feminista para los próximos cinco años. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, ministras, por tus sabias palabras. Eh, tengo ahora el honor de introducir al uh, Right Honorable Alok Sharma with a video. Greetings to you all and thank you for inviting me to join this event. Today, the courageous people of Ukraine are at the forefront of all our minds. The Putin regime's illegal invasion is a violation of the principles that every country is committed to uphold. And supporting and standing with Ukraine alongside our international partners is rightly our immediate priority. Yet, the chronic threat of climate change remains. We all know that women are disproportionately affected by climate change. And this was confirmed by the IPCC's recent report, which frankly made for very grim reading. Yet we also know that women are central to reducing our emissions and to adapting to the effects of climate change. And I'm proud that we made progress on gender and climate at COP26 in Glasgow last November. It was my privilege to speak alongside the young Samoan climate activist Brianna Fruin and others at COP26 Gender Day. And the high-level COP26 presidency event on gender equality and climate saw a number of countries and organizations make new commitments. Bolivia committed to promote the leadership of women and girls in climate action, particularly those from indigenous, Afro-Bolivian and rural communities. And the 2X Collaborative launched a new tool to help private investors put gender at the heart of climate finance flows. And the historic Glasgow Climate Pact, agreed by almost 200 countries, encourages parties to increase the participation and leadership of women in climate action and ensure gender responsive implementation. This is in line with the Gender Action Plan, which all parties agreed to at COP25. These are real achievements in terms of commitments. Our task now is to deliver. And urging countries to honor the promises made in the Glasgow Climate Pact is my absolute priority for the COP26 presidency year. We're urging public and private finance providers to make their climate finance more gender responsive. We're calling on all countries to strengthen their implementation of the Gender Action Plan as they adapt and reduce emissions. And we will continue to ensure the voices of women and girls in all their diversity inform our COP26 presidency. We know the need for climate action is urgent. We know what we need to do. And we know that gender is central to delivering on climate action. So let's work together over this year and beyond to deliver for women and girls. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for uh, Right Honorable Alok Sharma, uh, words of encouragement for the future and how we should move forward. Ahora tengo el honor de presentar, bienvenida Alejandra Guiguantar, es un honor tenerte con nosotras hoy. Adelante. Muchas gracias, estimada Lorena, eh, por poner la palabra en este diálogo. Eh, voy a hablar de mi pueblo, Guanmi. Me siento muy honrada de hablar hoy sobre lo que nuestra coalición de acción quiere hacer para ayudar a todas las mujeres y niñas en su plena diversidad a liderar una transición justa hacia una economía verde, amplificar las voces de los 
defensores en todos los ámbitos. Como joven y mujer indígena, es necesario que nuestras voces sean espacios de toma de decisiones, especialmente del clima, como también promover la adopción de tecnologías ancestrales de cuidado del suelo que permitan reducir el uso de agroquímicos y lleven a una agricultura familiar. Es importante mencionar que las mujeres indígenas son portadoras de un gran conocimiento asociado a la administración de los recursos naturales. Sin embargo, están en peligro un modelo económico que vulnera los derechos de la madre tierra. Por ello, es fundamental generar diálogos interculturales, intergeneracionales e intercientíficos que lleven a una participación inclusiva y el diseño de políticas transversales no coloniales. Por otro lado, las mujeres tienen poco acceso a servicios educativos para desarrollar carreras en los sectores medioambientales. Ahora mismo, las mujeres y las niñas son una pequeña minoría en estos campos, especialmente para las mujeres de base. Necesitamos trabajar de manera colectiva con los gobiernos, donantes, movimientos juveniles y organizaciones de la sociedad civil para transformar el diálogo de las políticas en relación al cambio climático. Es necesario reconocer, reducir y redistribuir la economía del cuidado y poner a las comunidades más vulnerables como tomadores de decisiones. Muchas veces las políticas ambientales no son acorde con las realidades que tienen las mujeres en los territorios y esto se debe en parte a la falta de datos sobre los efectos del cambio climático pero además el acceso a financiamiento es limitado, especialmente para las niñas. Para apoyar este liderazgo, nuestra coalición de acción ha creado compromisos para invertir en centros de conocimiento y plataformas digitales que conecten a las mujeres y a las niñas, especialmente a las mujeres de base y a las niñas indígenas, para facilitar las capacidades, las herramientas educativas, los recursos necesarios para asumir funciones de liderazgo y poder de decisión en el ámbito de la justicia climática y aumentar el conocimiento y el acceso a los servicios financieros. Tenemos que crear un mayor y mejor acceso a todos los niveles de las herramientas educativas necesarios para crear carreras en los sectores de la economía verde, como también invertir en modelos de cooperativas con equidad de género, en particular lideradas por mujeres y niñas. Es necesario aumentar la recogida y el uso de datos sobre el nexo entre género y medio ambiente para informar sobre las políticas, estrategias y acciones de promoción que cuenta el género centrándose en todas las regiones. Gracias por esta oportunidad de hablar sobre la importancia de apoyar el liderazgo de mujeres, de las mujeres jóvenes y las niñas a nivel de base. Pero sin antes, quiero mencionar que como juventud, juventudes indígenas, es necesario tener diálogos de financiamiento climático y sostenible, colocando como prioridad la vida y reduciendo el valor de la capital. Hoy, que prime más que los intereses económicos de un país. Muchas gracias, estimada Lorena. Muchas gracias, Alejandra. Muchas gracias por acordarnos el tema de la interseccionalidad y la diversidad, que las mujeres no somos un grupo homogéneo y que requerimos eh, acciones y procesos diferenciados. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Now we'll move to the next section. We're going to talk about action towards feminist climate justice. And our speakers are going to address the progress in implementing the FAC individual and collective commitments and the UNFCCC gender action plan. They're going to share challenges and best practices, solutions to advance feminist action for climate justice related to the four pillars of the FAC blueprint. Let me introduce you to the four outstanding speakers. We have Dili Severin, uh, Director of Advocacy and Communication from Data to X, on behalf of the Collective Commitment on Gender and Environmental Data Alliance, known as GIDA. We also have Sunita Pitamber, Associate Director for Access to Services and Gender Green from ABRD. Sigita Stromsky, 
Coordinator for Sustainable Development and Gender Environment Directorate from OECD, on behalf of UNDP, OECD, and UN Women, and Mr. Kuo Chi Wu, IFAT Senior Management Gender Champion and Associate uh, Vice President. So um, I will now ask uh, Dili Severin, who is going to talk more on the leadership and participation. The floor is yours, Dili. Thank you so much, Lorena. You and women, uh, the Feminist uh, Action for Climate Justice Action Coalition leaders, and of course, to the governments of Costa Rica and the United Kingdom for sponsoring this event. Um, I just wanna say quickly that I'm using my phone. So I have a little bit of a creative setup here. So if I'm looking between screens, it's not because I'm distracted. I'm just trying to make sure that I'm focused. So again, thank you so much for having me. Um, as Lorena mentioned, that I am the Director of Advocacy and Communications for Data2x. Uh, Data2x is a gender data alliance that mobilizes action to make gender data central to global efforts to achieve gender equality. Um, so today, it's really my pleasure to be speaking about JADA, uh, the Gender and Environment Data Alliance, a major new initiative under the Feminist uh, Action for Climate Justice Blueprint. Uh, we really think it has the potential to drive evidence-based policymaking that boosts climate resiliency and, of course, gender equality. Uh, but first, I want to just say a quick word about why, why gender data. Um, uh, we really believe that gender data is a powerful tool that can accelerate uh, gender equality. Um, how does it do that? We really see gender data as being able to shed light on disparities, for example, on the gendered impacts of crises like COVID-19, but of course, of climate change as well. Um, gender data, of course, can help illuminate policy solutions and help us monitor progress toward our shared goals, which I think is why we're, we're all here today. Um, unfortunately, you know, less, uh, less than half of countries worldwide have data available to monitor SDG5 uh, on gender equality and fewer still have regularly collected data over time, which of course impedes our efforts to track global progress. Um, this is true across every sustainable development goal uh, where gender relevant indicators suffer from poor coverage. Um, and unfortunately, we do know that data on the gender environment nexus is particularly lacking. Uh, so for example, uh, no internationally standardized framework to monitor climate change currently exists. And of course, that impedes our efforts to track and to respond to the disproportionate effects um, that, the, that climate change has on women, girls, and other marginalized communities. Uh, the good news, though, is that uh, the recognition for the need for more and better gender data is already well established in global climate policy. So most recently, uh, UNFCCC's Enhanced Lima Work Program uh, adopted at COP25 calls for increased technical capacity building and availability of sex disaggregated data under its gender action plan. So that's great news. But we know that without further action, uh, the unique inequities faced by women, girls, and gender non-conforming people will continue to remain unaddressed. Uh, last year, the Generation Equality Forum outlined a, a really positive path for change. Um, and while all action coalitions called for gender data collection and use, we really saw the greatest leadership on gender data come from the Feminist Action for Climate Justice uh, Action Coalition, uh, which outlined the only uh, action blueprint wide to explicitly focus on increasing the collection and use of data. Um, so to, to fulfill the ambitious uh, vision set out by the Feminist Action um, for Climate Justice Action Coalition leaders and commitment makers, I really think our efforts must be collaborative. And I think that really speaks to why Data2x is so excited about the collective commitment spearheaded by uh, the Women's Environment and Development Organization and the IUCN. Uh, we are thrilled to be working with both WeDo and IUCN and a motivated group of multi-stakeholder partners to pioneer JADA, again, the Gender and Environment Data Alliance. Uh, JADA was really conceived uh, to catalyze and scale gender disaggregated data and intersectional analysis for gender just climate and environmental action. Um, and thanks to the outstanding leadership of WeDo and IUCN, uh, JADA has already made progress to begin operations and define a shared mission. Um, JADA aims to improve the availability, accessibility, understanding, and application of high quality and robust data and information at the nexus of gender and the environment. 
Um, as a member of the Alliance, uh, as a membership alliance, JADA really serves as a, a hub for diverse organizations working at the intersection of gender and the environment to come together through a gender data lens. Um, and by identifying and filling in existing gender data gaps, JADA supports gender just and evidence-based uh, environment and climate action that meets the needs of all people and all their diversity. Um, I'm told I'm being I'm speaking very fast, so I will I will slow down a little bit. Um, Jada um, will present tools, frameworks, and approaches to advance really looking at systemic gender transformative shifts uh, in policy, programming, financing, and planning. Uh, we really hope that together we will support and elevate the efforts of marginalized actors, promoting feminist participatory action, research, and other non-traditional practices of data and evidence collection. Um, pragmatically, you know, JADA will collect and uplift existing work, convening efforts around gender and environment data to promote high quality gender transformative data collection, dissemination, and use. Um, and critically, of course, JADA will encourage open and transparent collection and sharing of data upholding our vision of data as as a public good. So I really will stop here and just say once again, you know, Data2x thanks we do, the IUCN and all of our partners for working to collaboratively launch this critical new alliance. We really look forward to our shared work program ahead. Um, and in the meantime, uh, we're really focused on this year's Commission on the Status of Women as a major opportunity to build on the Action Coalition's ambitious uh, vision to deliver the data we need. We see the commission being really well poised to elevate calls for investment and innovation. And it's really critical that the agreed conclusions reinsert critical mm -hmm. past languaging on financing for gender data and policy use. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dili. Thank you so much for your knowledge and for sharing all the great work that we still have ahead when it comes uh, for data collection, but also the use of that data in policies and other processes to inform those processes. Now I have the honor to introduce Sunita Pitambir, and she's gonna talk a little bit more on finance. Sunita, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Lorena, and good afternoon, good evening uh, to everyone. Uh, let me first of all start by thanking uh, the UN Women for bringing us all together and also the governments of Costa Rica and the UK uh, for sharing the, this platform with us. Um, it is my pleasure to be part of the Action Coalition on Climate climate justice uh, under the generation equality and uh, as EBRD is the only MDB on this um, action coalition, we are very honored to be part of this community. Um, at the generation equality uh, meetings and uh, in, in the summit last June in, in Paris, uh, the EBRD has committed to take forward three main areas that help promote gender equality in climate change and climate action. First of all, we have said that we'll do more on bringing in green skills for women uh, and bringing them into green jobs as well. We've also committed to uh, do more on uh, bringing uh, increased financial access for uh, female entrepreneurs in the green uh, economy. And last but not least, we've also committed to do more on gender and climate action policy, specifically promoting uh, more women in climate leadership, as well as corporate climate governance. And I'm happy to report to you today the progress we have made so far. Um, on the skills side, we have, uh, as of today, been able to work very closely with all the private sector clients and national institutions under the uh, Egypt Renewable Energy Framework, supporting all the companies which are closely uh, working on the renewable energy sector. And we have advised them and brought uh, new ideas to these companies to establish new training skills, bringing in more women to be trained in the green jobs and, and getting them employment opportunities. Uh, we have done a similar work in Kazakhstan, which has been uh, widely accepted uh, in, in that sector and increasing more and more women uh, in, in the green uh, skills as well. 
uh, we have also been able to support in uh, Kazakhstan uh, specifically in the green mobility uh, sector, bringing in more and more women to access uh, employment as um, uh, green uh, vehicle uh, drivers and, and, and promoters of green vehicle uh, jobs, operations and maintenance. And this was particularly important and a breakthrough because in, in the past it was difficult for women to access um, jobs as, as drivers in green vehicles. And we have been able to work with the clients and the government to help uh, remove these barriers to uh, access to these uh, jobs. Uh, we have uh, also with our green cities programs within the municipalities, working co closely with municipalities, created new uh, areas of uh, employment for women within the green nexus. So it has been quite a, a, an important um, road and, and we have been able to deliver on some of these um, commitments. On the finance, on the increasing uh, to, to, of green finance, we have been able to also deliver very well uh, under the green economy financing facility. I'm happy to report that in eight countries, we have been able to support at least 400 women uh, entrepreneurs to access finance for green technologies to establish uh, more greening of their businesses as well as um, sustainability at the homes uh, that they, uh, they have uh, already access to. So this has been quite an important um, partnership. We work with partner financial institutions, uh, training their loan officers to remove the hidden bias that there exists, that we know exists in, in loan applications by, by women. So we've trained loan officers to, to be more gender aware, gender sensitive, as well as partner financial institutions, managements and, and senior uh, directors. So this has been quite an important achievement as well. And we have also uh, enjoyed that many of these partner financial institutions have seen the value and, and are increasing uh, this access to many of their branches in some of these countries. Uh, we have, uh, to be more specific, we have, for example, in, in Tajikistan, been able to increase uh, the number of women who are able to access green loans uh, to almost 40% in 2021. And this was only about 12% in 2018. So this has been quite an important uh, breakthrough. And, and those of you who know the financial sector in Tajikistan, this is quite a, bench, a big benchmark uh, because uh, this uh, performance is, uh, is quite uh, progressive. Uh, we have also been able Able to in Kazakhstan, for example, reach almost 66% of the female uh, borrowers in, in some of the partner financial institutions we work with. Um, we have also supported, the, together with the EIB and CDC, uh, the design of the gender uh, lens, gender smart climate finance toolkit, which uh, by, by, by chance uh, the Honorable um, Minister, Mr. Alok Sharma, uh, spoke about under the 2x climate task force. So we have partnered with our EIB and CDC partners to launch this at the COP26, and we will be going forward to, to implement it. Very quickly, uh, we have on the third commitment uh, launched together with the African Development Bank and the Agence Francaise de Développement, uh, the Green, uh, the Gender and Climate Action Fast Track Initiative, which will address policy constraints both for private sector and public sector to uh, clear the way for more um, gender equality in, in the key sectors like renewables and, and energy and agriculture. So these are some of the very important areas. We're taking our commitments forward in our new gender strategy where the focus on gender equality and climate action is central. And we are going to be promoting that in our investments in the next five years uh, in all the priority areas, as I mentioned. I'll just stop here. And, and these are just some of the thoughts and we are happy to take any questions as they come. Thank you very much, Laurie. Thank you so much. Uh uh, Sunita for sharing IBDR um, efforts and I have to say like you bring back hope for implementation showing the way of how we need to do how to move from word and commitments to actions uh, thank you very much and really looking forward to learn 
more of all these great efforts uh, that you're doing. Thank you, Sunita. I now have the honor of introducing uh, Sigita Stromsky. Um, she's gonna concentrate more on data. Sigita, the floor is yours. Sigita, you are muted. You need to unmute. Thank you very much, Lorena. I think uh, there is someone who, who would be sharing slides for me. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, so uh, thanks again, Lorena and the organizers for, for this opportunity to present uh, such a timely and important event. We are pleased to announce a collaboration between the UNDP, the UN Women, the OECD, and um, other members of a consortium of global organizations to prepare a new tool, the COVID-19 Global Gender Response Tracker with a Green Lens. Next slide, please. Uh, the new tool is uh, set to launch in June 2022. Um, it builds on the success of two existing policy databases to help identify the level of alignment between countries' COVID-19 recovery measures and their SDG commitments. This work contributes to the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Action Coalition, which launched um, last year. Next slide. So the global gender response tracker with a green lens will look at government's COVID-19 responses in two steps. First, it applies a green lens to measures in the UNDP, UN Women COVID-19 Global Gender Response Tracker by identifying the environmental implications of gender sensitive policies. Second, it applies a gender lens to the measures in the OECD Green Recovery Database. The result is a collection of policy measures that are both gender sensitive and green. For example, providing training for women in green jobs or giving subsidies for women-owned businesses to invest in sustainable infrastructure. Next slide, please. Uh, to better understand uh, how the gender tracker with the green lens will be developed, let's look at the two policy databases and their key findings. First, the COVID-19 Global Gender Response Tracker, which launched in September 2020, co-created by the UNDP and the UN Women, monitors gender-sensitive measures enacted by governments in response to COVID-19. The tracker draws from existing online policy databases and um, also benefits from uh, research support from a valuable team of UN online volunteers. It currently includes nearly 5,000 measures across, across 226 countries and territories. Next slide. So to determine if a policy measure is gender sensitive, the tracker looks whether it addresses one or more of the following, violence against women, women's economic security or unpaid care work. The tracker also looks at women's participation and leadership in the COVID-19 response, data that was compiled with a gender inequality research lab at the University of Pittsburgh. Right. Okay. To date, the tracker shows that the global COVID-19 policy response has been largely gender blind. Only 18% of all socioeconomic measures in the tracker address women's economic security or unpaid care work. But it is encouraging that 163 countries have taken 853 measures to address the surge of violence against women during the pandemic. Uh, data on national COVID-19 task forces reveals a potential reason for gender-blind policy response. Of the 334 task forces analyzed, women make up only 24% task force members and lead only 19% of all task forces. Next slide. 
Um, the OECD Green Recovery Database was created in April 2021 uh, to catalog COVID-19 policy measures that are likely to have an impact across one or more environmental dimensions. It contains around 1,380 measures with the environmental relevance spread over 44 countries and the European Union and covers various areas, including energy, pollution, and uh, waste management. Next slide, please. Uh, the OECD Green Recovery Database shows that green recovery measures are relatively small part of the overall stimulus packages and, and that gender relevant measures are a small fraction of those making up less than 3% of the green policy measures. These gender relevant uh, green recovery measures overwhelmingly have positive impacts on the environment in sectors such as buildings, energy, and surface transport. These findings suggest that including gender considerations in green recovery measures could contribute to both improving gender equality and environmental outcomes. So the Green Recovery Database and the Gender Tracker are both living databases that are being continuously refined. They provide strong insight into the current trends in COVID-19 response, but uh, provisionary findings should be interpreted with caution due to the difficult responses. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, next slide. Yeah, to build forward better from the pandemic and ensure a gender equitable green recovery, it's important to focus on five areas. So invest in green and gender responsive social protection and unpaid care, prevent and address violence against women, support women's economic empowerment in the green economy, support women's leadership in crisis response and climate action at all levels, and push towards renewed social contracts and resilient economic models. So the gender tracker with a green lens will help provide guidance for policymakers and uh, evidence for advocates to navigate these uh, better pathways forward. Next slide. So the UNDP, UN Women Global Gender Response Tracker, is a strong tool for identifying these important lessons for sustainable recovery efforts. And the new partnership with the OECD Green Recovery Database will help us work towards a more environmentally sustainable and uh, gender equitable future. And the last slide, just to say, stay tuned for more information on this tracker coming in June uh, 2022. And you can also visit our online databases or reach out to us via email for more information. So thank you very much again. Thank you, Sigita. Thank you so much for your powerful and rich data uh, PowerPoint. We can't wait to see it really unfolding uh, coming soon. And uh, now I have the honor to introduce uh, Gucci Wu. And it's going to talk more about uh, resilience, uh, which is your, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Lorena. Please bear with me if there is any problems with my uh, voice controlled uh, lamp. And also thanks uh, to you and women for giving me this opportunity to talk about how EFED is promoting a feminist approach for climate justice and how we support the capacity of women and girls in all their diversity in building resilience to climate and disaster risks. Climate change is not a problem for the future. It is a problem already now, and it is testing the resilience of people around the world, especially those living in rural areas. As we have heard from other guest speakers, Women and girls are particularly affected by the effects of climate change because of persisting inequalities and discrimination. Indeed, gender is one of the key determining factors in defining power relations, what people do, what they own, and who decides. 
vulnerability to climate change is shaped by these realities. Women's and girls' capacity to adapt, to access resources, information, alternative livelihood options, and to be part of the decision-making process is heavily shaped by the unequal distribution of resources and support. Let me share some examples and practices of effort with you. In Indonesia, from 2013 to 2017, EFERT financed the Coastal Community Development Project. It took a comprehensive co approach combining sustainable marine and coastal natural resources management with economic and livelihood development in coastal and small island communities where poverty was endemic. The project promoted sustainable fishery and aquaculture production practices by providing production inputs and established processing facilities and market linkages, through which women primarily engaged in fish processing and marketing. Women's empowerment increased by 27%, while fish productivity increased by 78% and post harvest losses decreased by 5%. Other benefits included more diverse diets with higher consumption of seafood, dairy, and fruits. Let me highlight the three categories of interventions which promote climate resilience for rural women in effort financed projects. The first is participatory adaptation planning with examples in Sudan, Bolivia, Mali, Nepal, Sudan, Vietnam, and Uganda. Participatory adaptation planning allows rural women to participate in decisions about climate smart infrastructure and climate sensitive natural resources at community level. For instance, in Nepal, women constitute 56% of the members of the adaptation committees responsible for the local adaptation plans for action. In Lao PDR, half of the members of similar forest management committees are women. And in Sudan, around 33% of adaptation planning committees responsible for the rentland and dry forest management plans are comprised of women. The second one is the engagement of women in economic activities, such as market uh, gardening and small livelihood, lively stock raising to increase income and diversified livelihoods in Vietnam, Sudan, Gambia, Mozambique, Mali, Lao PDR, Niger, Ethiopia. In Mozambique, Women represent 65% of the smallholder farmers involved in cassava and vegetable value chains. They have adopted varieties and breeds that are better adapted to climate change. The third is access to extension services and trainings. In addition to the countries listed previously in Chad, Nicaragua, and Uganda, women are well represented in farmer field schools with specific circular, uh, sorry, curricula on new income opportunities to adapt to climate change. For instance, in Gambia, women form 70% of the persons having access to trainings. And the project in Nigeria set up specific farmer field schools for women. Access and control over land and natural resources have proved to be a game changer to improving the leadership of women and girls in long lasting solutions that contribute immensely to global needs. For over four decades, EFERT has worked to promote rural women's legal rights in various ways from helping women obtain basic government issued identification to actively increasing their land tenure. At EFERT, we also recognize that for far too long now, limited access to finance 
has undermined investment in gender just climate solutions. During the Generation Equality Forum in Paris last year, we announced IFA's commitment to mobilizing 500 million US dollar by 2024 through our enhanced adaptation for smallholder agriculture program, ISAP Plus. This 100% climate financing mechanism was first launched in 2012, and it is envisioned to be the largest fund dedicated to channeling climate finance to small scale producers. To date, almost 6 million poor smallholder household members have been supported through the first ISAP phase in 41 countries across the world, and at least 40% of all beneficiaries have been women. The next phase of the program is expected to benefit more than 10 million people, particularly women and youth, and in doing so, it will increase their capacity to cope with the effects of climate change and to build their resilience to disaster risks. Rural indigenous and grassroots women farmers sh shoulder the negative impact of the climate crisis as the um, previous guest speakers have alluded to. In Paris, Ifert also shared its commitment to ensuring that 35% of our newly designed projects during 2022 to 2024 are gender transformative. This means that our projects and programs actively seek to build equitable social norms and structures in addition to individual gender equitable behavior. Transformative programs and interventions aim to create opportunities for individuals to actively challenge and change structural barriers, social norms, and behaviors that lead to power inequalities. In conclusion, EFERT recognizes that promoting climate justice is a collective effort. Therefore, we are proud to be one of the co-leaders of the Action Coalition for Feminist Action for Climate Justice, and we are fully committed to its five-year blueprint. Advancing gender dust climate action is only possible through the equal and meaningful participation and leadership of women and girls in all their diversity. If it stands ready to share its knowledge, financing, and partnership to support feminist action for climate justice. Thank you. And back to you, Lorena. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers, to Dili, to Sunita, to Sigita, and to Gucci for, for sharing your efforts and your initiatives. Those of you that know me, um, there are three things that are, that are more important, and it is implementation, implementation, and implementation. Thank you for sharing um, how to move forward on this. Now uh, we move to the next section of our event on the youth perspectives and the outcomes of the CSW Youth Forum. And I have the honor to introduce um, Anne Eloise and Aishka Najib from Friday for Future, Most Affected People and Areas uh, MAPA. The floor is your ladies. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Lorena, for the introduction. Um, I'm Aishka Najib. I'm Anya Loisi. Um, and Fridays for Future MAPA, which stands for Most Affected People in Area, joined this UN Women Initiative launched at last year's Generation Equality Forum because we wanted to include diverse youth voices in decision-making spaces and pressure world leaders to take action on climate emergency. This year, we co-organized the CSW 66 Youth Forum, which took place on the 4th and 5th of March. The forum convened over 1,700 participants and fulfilled its purpose of acting as a, as, as a platform to bring together global adolescents, youth, 
foreground concerns on interlinkages between gender, climate change, enviro and environmental disaster risk reduction, with a particular focus on the grassroots and community voices, provided space for global youth to endorse the global youth recommendations as well as explore how young people and adolescents can meaningfully engage in intergovernmental political process and strengthen an ecosystem of youth partners who can support the journey from CSW 66 to COP 27. We are pleased to inform you that over 25 community level consultations on the theme were held some by our Feminist Action Coalition for Climate Justice Youth Leaders, which engaged over 1,500 uh, youth from across six regions, such as North America, Latin America and the Caribbean, Europe and Central Asia, uh, Africa, Southwest Asia and North Africa. These consultations were highly diverse and showed us the importance of taking a bottom-up approach and building from the demands of those at the grassroots level to facilitate a strong movement for change. Results from the consultations focused on the intersections between social justice and climate change, the disproportionate effect of environmental disasters on the most vulnerable communities, resourcing climate finance for adaptation, and acknowledging historical responsibilities, and taking actions to cut emissions, ensuring meaningful participation of women, girls, and youth in all of their diversities in decision-making processes, and the need for a new model of climate action, which centers decolonization efforts. These results formed a set of practical recommendations that we have used to inform the discussions around the working text of agreed conclusions, which was published on 24th February. Following this, in response to the agreed conclusions, working text revision one, the revised global youth recommendations, youth, gender, and climate was drafted by FACJ leaders. National Gender Youth Advocates and the Global Youth and was published on March 1st. Today, as we are joined by several stakeholders who are engaged in various capacities at the CSW 66 and the crucial sectors facilitating change, we call on you to help us overcome the, the, the existence discrepancies and reimagine a better world that's, that is greener and just. We recognize that the negotiation processes are ongoing and seek your support in encouraging our delegation to integrate our recommendations into the agreed conclusions. That being said to us, the way forward is tied to collective action. The climate crisis does not exist in a vacuum. Rather, it intersects with socioeconomic issues. It intensifies gender inequalities and disproportionately affects vulnerable communities, including women, girls, and youth in all their diversities. We need to address these intersecting systems of oppression and fight for our collective liberation. To all the global youth advocates, we hope that this extensive and concrete compilation of global youth voices will serve your policy and advocacy efforts and activities. As global youth, climate and gender advocates, we count on you and your support to engage from the grassroots to national and international levels to accelerate change. And I would be more than happy to send in the links to our recommendations in English, French, as well as Spanish version in the chat box right now. And last but not least, the world needs us, all of us. Thank you, Lorena. Thank you guys for the opportunity. Over to you. Thank you, Eloise. And thank you, Aisha, for such an inspiring presentation. And please do share um, the draft that you said or the position that you just uh, said. I now have the honor to introduce Angie Daze, Senior Policy Advisor and Gender Equality Lead International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD speaking on taking a commitment forward. Angie, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lorena, and thanks to the organizers for the opportunity. It's really a pleasure to be here today to talk about the commitment made by the International Institute for Sustainable Development, IISD, and how we plan to take it forward. As we heard from the latest IPCC report, adaptation action is an increasingly urgent priority to manage the impacts of climate change. Some investments in adaptation are already being made through government budgets, international climate finance mechanisms, development partners, and the private sector. 
But it's clear that these must be massively scaled up and this can't happen quickly enough. National Adaptation Plan or NAP processes are a key policy entry point for gender responsive climate action. NAPs will drive investments in adaptation in the coming years, making them an essential vehicle to build capacities and channel resources to build the resilience of women and girls to the impacts of climate change. In its role as the Secretariat of the NAP Global Network, IISD has worked with over 50 countries to advance their NAP processes through technical assistance, peer-to-peer -peer learning processes, and knowledge sharing. At the Generation Equality Forum, we committed to working with interested government partners to advance gender responsive adaptation action through NAP processes. We made this commitment with two governments who are already showing leadership in this area, Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, and we hope to bring more countries on board as we move forward. Among the countries who have already submitted NAP documents to the UNFCCC, we find that the vast majority are recognizing the linkages between gender equality and effective adaptation action. However, this is only an initial step. If we want adaptation action to yield equitable benefits for people of all genders and social groups, we need to ensure that an intersectional gender responsive approach is applied throughout planning, implementation, budgeting, and monitoring and evaluation. Looking forward, we've identified three key priorities, among many, to enable gender responsive NAP processes. The first is establishing solid institutional arrangements for adaptation that facilitate collaboration among gender and climate actors. Key to this is ensuring that the ministry responsible for gender equality is part of any and all cross-ministerial decision-making bodies that are established to advance climate action. The second priority that we see is strengthening civil society participation in adaptation decision-making. This includes women's groups, indig indigenous and community-based organizations, youth groups, and advocates for people who face discrimination. Having these actors at the table when decisions are made is essential for inclusive and gender responsive action. And we need to find practical and effective mechanisms to facilitate meaningful engagement of civil society actors in national processes. The third priority is around tackling discriminatory norms, behaviors, and practices within institutions. When talking about gender responsive climate action, there's a tendency to focus on dynamics within communities when in fact the social and cultural context also strongly influences what happens within governments and other institutions that are involved in adaptation. We need to understand these issues and work to transform social norms towards institutions that are gender balanced and representative of the diverse communities that they serve. We're committed to working with our existing partners and to forming new partnerships with governments and other stakeholders to move these priorities forward through gender responsive NAP processes. Our aim is to build a network of experts and advocates with the power and the influence to transform the way adaptation action is planned and implemented and how progress is tracked. This will help to ensure that adaptation investments yield gender equitable benefits and that they are effective in building the resilience of women and girls in all their diversity. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Andy, for your intervention and for sharing all the efforts that you're doing. Now, due to time, I have to say that we're gonna open the floor for a Q&A process. I will ask everybody to embrace the, the rule of keys, keep it short and simple uh, so that we can hear from as much of you uh, of our audience. So we'll have an opportunity for two to three interventions. Uh, Rosaline, um, I don't know if we have any questions or please uh, put in the chat if you have any questions that you want to raise, uh, please go ahead from our audience and please tell us who you are directing the question to. Yes, so please feel free to go ahead and you can use the Q&A function at the bottom or you can, as uh, Lorena graciously said, put your question in the chat. We do have a question from one audience member that I saw earlier in the chat where she asked, um, how can you work with OECD to allow women to access green projects or access to 
green projects is how she phrases it. Can we have our um, colleague from OECD? Yes. Uh, oh, yeah, Sigita, hi. <laughs> hi again. Yeah, th th thank you for the question. Um, well, the, the presentation was not exactly about the green projects, but uh, well, if you have any question on uh, additional OECD work on um, on uh, gender and, and green, uh, please uh, write to me and uh, we will follow up uh, bilaterally um, because the presentation we had was on, on a joint work with UNDP and, and you and women and, and collecting data. But if you have additional questions, uh, we would be happy to answer. So please don't hesitate to contact us. Sigita, will it be okay if we put your information on the chat or an email where people can reach out? Sure, sure, no problem. Thank you, thank you for that. Um, Rosaline, any other question? Um, Colleagues, any other one? Um, yes, we have a question for Dilly Severin. How will you ensure that girls as well as women are captured in the data? So this is for Dilly. Thanks so much for the question. Um, I guess this is this speaks to some of the, the goals of, of Jada in terms of really trying to ensure that um, all populations are, are visible. Um, so I think um, we have to start thinking about, first of all, from a gender data perspective, at least having sex disaggregation as our minimum. So that's one way to capture at least some women and girls, but we know that there is a great diversity um, of, of, of um, identity there. So I would just say that this is part of the work of Jada in terms of really figuring out figuring out intersectional approaches to capture all of women's and girls' identities and other uh, communities, but it is a work in progress. I would also say, in addition to making sure that we um, ensure that all communities are visible, once they are visible, we want to make sure that the data is being actually used to inform decision making, because otherwise, uh, we can't create those responsive policies that are actually speaking to their unique needs. So there's not, unfortunately, a, a one size fits all, but I think we need to do more to collect and analyze sex disaggregated data at a minimum, and then think about how we can go beyond that and apply a more intersectional lens to um, gender data. Thank you very much. And Dilly, we have a, a quick follow up for you. Um, someone, Christy at a higher education institution in the US wants to know how can higher ed support this fantastic work? Um, so unfortunately, because I'm on my phone, I don't have, I can't type the information for the Alliance in the chat, but if Katie or someone else wouldn't mind doing so, um, please do reach out um, uh, to, to us via um, the information in the chat in terms of how to become a part of Jada, how, how one can support in terms of research or other um, um, activities, and that would be the best way to follow up from there so you can get involved. Thank you very much, uh, Dili, for all that information. Well, we, we're almost at our closing time. Um, I want to take this opportunity to thank UN Women and to thank everyone that has been working uh, so hard uh, to make this event uh, possible and uh, also for the governments of Costa Rica and the United Kingdom. I don't pretend to do a resume of what has been said, but uh, just to point out some final thoughts. Uh, regrettably, gender continues to be one of the world's strongest markers for disadvantage, as we have heard, which is why reducing inequality is fundamental to achieving the SDG and other international agree upon goals. Today, gender disparities remain among the most pervasive of all inequalities, hindering the best of development efforts. Unlike the coronavirus, there is, there is not, nor will there be a vaccine against climate change or gender inequality. Effectively facing challenges, so as environmental degradation and climate change requires profound structural changes and many of them are associated with our behavior. Under the fact we have more than 225 commitments and we have heard how some institutions are really moving forward, but the time for action and implementation has never been more imperative. The recovery plans post COVID-19 and the global commitments toward the transition to a greener economy opens up the possibility to build a new future 
based on the three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental. Where gender equality is at the basis of a progressive structural change. A gender transformational shift requires understanding the interconnectedness, as we have heard, of the social, economic, and environmental pillars of sustainability, to be able to assess and balance the potential implications of an action program or policy in the different pillars. As asserted by the Secretary General of the United Nations, we must emphasize the need to step up commitments to realize all the goals and visions outlined in intergovernmental instrument and outcomes and ensure that commitments undertaken at the international level are implemented at the national, local, and community level and cooperation and together with diverse women and girls, especially those who will not be most, that will be most affected by such international decisions and commitments. In the words of the SG, let us shift the view, let us shift the narrative. Women and girls, we are agents and leaders. We are not just vulnerable. We portrayed, we are portrayed as vulnerable and are made to behave as vulnerable by the society, the culture, the institutions, the practices, the laws that we cannot avoid and that are forced into us to operate in. We need to dismantle the power structures that allow discrimination, violence, and economic hardship to keep one half of the humanity down. We cannot abuse, those are my words, and exploit the earth it is past time we realize the same is true for women. And as Anne and Aisha remind us, the world needs all, all of us. Thank you for everyone. Have a great CSW. Thank you so much, Lorena. Um, wonderful work as our, our moderator and guide today. And I want to offer a, another huge thank to thank you to all of our speakers, um, to everybody for their incredible commitments and leadership. And I really also want to invite those in our audience to engage with the Feminist Action for Climate Justice Action Coalition. Some of you are already commitment makers and I'm excited to get to know you. And others of you may be here because you want to learn more about what is happening with gender equality for climate justice. And I posted my uh, email address in the chat and I invite you to reach out to me if you would like to get more involved. And I also invite you to continue to attend these fantastic side events for CSW 66 and Generation Equality. Thank you. And oh, one other thank you. I have to thank our team. Thank you to yes. everybody who worked so hard to make yes. today happen for from the technical to the interpretation, um, it's been, it's, this is such an amazing team at, um, with the Action Coalition. So thank you to our team as well. Thank you to everyone. And thank you, Rosaline and Carla and interpreters and everyone. All right. And with that, we will sign off. Have a great 24 hours around the clock and generation <laughs> equality. Bye. Thank you.